Hi, everyone, and welcome to session 6C, Individual Papers, Craftivism. I'm Caroline Kipp, and I'll be the session's moderator. Please feel free to enter your questions in the Q&A, and we'll address them at the end of the presentations. We'll begin with Zenovia Taludi presenting on object-made quilts and migrant structural textiles, followed by Hinda Mandel presenting Rochester Ladies' Anti-Slavery Sewing Society, Race and Gender in Mid-19th Century Handicraft as a Tool for the Abolitionist Cause, Julie Hollenbach presenting Whose Personal is Political? Troubling Privileged Affect in White Feminist Craftivism, Catherine Dormer presenting The Art of Urgency, Textile Practice and Truth Telling, and finally, Alicia Maltz presenting the stories of welcome blanket makers. And so with that, Zenovia, would you begin sharing your screen? Thank you so much for having me in this uh, really inspiring conference. Um, I'm gonna start with my presentation on, on object made quilts and migrant structural textiles. It's first time and I put this work together. One second to find. A little bit about me. Um, I, I am an architect and artist and I and my art pieces um, are somehow architectural experiments, um, sometimes walls, roofs, floor surfaces or structures that in the near future they may become um, more normal architectures. So there are elements of architecture uh, with a hope to transform our lives. So this is presentation is about object made quilts out of migrant objects, experience stories, uh, structural textiles or surfaces such as quilts, curtains and walls. They all serve the hidden needs and oppressed desires of those individuals who are either migrants, foreigners, nomads or simply different. This presentation is non-linear as it weaves together a patchwork of interrelated ideas playing between soft heart, temporality, permanence, individuality, collectivity, old, new, exploring notions of home, identity, belonging. As a person without enough local roots, I ask, what can I do with my memory stories and objects? As an architect and artist, I ask, what kind of surfaces or walls building components um, can I build for a nomad's house or home? So essentially structural textiles and object made quilts, which contain the stories and or the objects might serve as architectural concepts, archetypes for stitching roots, giving structure to a nomad's home and honoring one's heritage. And this is the biggest text I have on screen. And um, I just wanted to say whatever is in green, gray color in this, in this text is um, my kind of architectural and more structural side. And what is yellow, is um, all the hidden uh, things, um, stories or immaterial things. And my effort in this uh, talk today is to bridge these two uh, parts of myself um, as an artist um, and a person. So here are the ideas that I am trying to put together. Uh, perhaps they seem uh, disconnected, but I, they've been like themes in my work uh, in different projects or scholar scholar work. So it's my art artwork uh, starting from the left of artwork, um, uh, making certain types of like installations and that um, object made a quilt that is inspiration for this uh, talk. Um, is, it was named uh, Mutant Moving Room. And I see that next to uh, Scenes of American Life, the quilt, which is a pictorial kit. So those two somehow resonate to me. And they are both about walls or, or structures. And I'm thinking like in the upper right, um, uh, ancient stones being incorporated in uh, Byzantine churches, from my experience in Greece, in many places, um, asking um, what is the history that makes it into the wall and then how we read from these walls our past. Um, on the lower left, again, um, another installation of mine, it's called from 
uh, for here to go cloud uh, tries to connect temporary and permanent, uh, the mobile and the static. Next uh, idea that links to this presentation is um, a collection of like objects by refugees um, is a big database of um, Asia Minor refugees of the 1920s that came from Asia Minor, now Turkey to Greece, Thrace, um, and an effort to document the, the objects they brought with them. Um, many of them from my own family, not many, some of them. Um, then I have the work from artists like El Anucci, who takes small uh, uh, material, mundane materials, um, and reuses them to make one big fabric that is between 2D and 3D, or it's between like a, like a surface and a structure. And some reference on like wicker work um, and the ideas of semper uh, that uh, walls come from fabrics and textiles. So here are the the two art projects. When I did my own installation, I wasn't aware of the scenes of American life, but I find it very interesting that these two structures, one is a curtain and the other is a quilt, um, uh, they contain one object and one stories. And um, these uh, stories or objects, they contain the personalization that I feel it's really necessary in architectural and physical space. And I look for ways to uh, bring these hidden lives outside. So even if I'm not in favor of pictorial art, I find this very provocative artwork. Um, I also, I found interesting that uh, it is the pictorial are a quilt. Um, since of American life. Uh, similarly with my installation, they have a substructure. Uh, in my case, it's metal like um, clips. In in the other work, it was uh, just like red um, circles that resemble, um, that resemble uh, flowers. And I find this also how you connect the stories, very interesting part of like integrating um, the, all the things into one whole. Here are um, the idea of this project for here to go cloud. Uh, I'm sorry, the idea of this project, Mutant Moving Room. It was that someone like me moved from Greece to USA and had to only bring two suitcases of things. And as I was in Chicago, there were certain items to whom I was connected. And at the same time, as a, some, as a student or an academic, I have and I continue to have to be very flexible moving around, not having furniture. And so this whole project is about, uh, was about and still is um, this kind of global nomad life. Um, uh, this is the installation in the exhibition. And as I mentioned, some of, I, it's called Mutant Moving Room, and uh, this was an exhibition of eight, eight particip participants, all of them coming from different parts of the world, but living temporarily at that time in Chicago. And my intention was to make my project very architectural as part of the space at that time um, with these objects. From uh, Regarding the quilt, Scenes of American Life, um, it's from 1920. And um, there are 55, I believe, vignettes of uh, scenes that describe American life pretty much quite common as we know, some of us know it right now. There is a bigger, um, there is a bigger uh, vignette, the farm that I have uh, pointed out here as kind of some like um, uh, researchers suggest that that might um, depict nostalgia or um, some kind of like um, need to connect to kind of more um, kind uh, knife and like simple lifestyle. Um, so for me it's also important this type of like work and, and having these scenes 
um, bring memories out, connect, uh, connecting to personal histories, uh, rituals, uh, things that once you are disconnected from some local place, it's hard to replace. So even if someone is simply a migrant and not a refugee, um, I believe still has a trauma uh, being disconnected with um, their own history and their own um, uh, identity. But I am really intrigued by this idea as well, that you can make something big out of many small items and these items may be very mundane or ordinary, like in the work of Anna Chui, uh, who is actually here at Dartmouth um, in the Hood Museum. Uh, is one of my favorite installations that has this kind of strength um, coming from something that we typically don't pay attention to. And I don't know if it's out of necessity, those items that we bring together. That was another installation I've made um, to talk about like uh, the mobile, the mobile mobility of people drinking coffee on the go, something um, we are not so familiar in Europe uh, as here, or at least in Greece. Um, so I wanted to, again, take something very mundane like the cup and bring many cups together and talk about this idea that we need to stop, to slow down and create a structure out of these small items and also small moments and enjoy and integrate them in our life. Um, and again, with the walls, like I am, uh, I am really, uh, amazed like many other people to see this kind of Byzantine walls like as patchwork of like materials and textures. Um, and at the same time in these walls um, of Byzantine history, uh, there are always um, ancient, uh, ancient stones, elements from like from temples from antiquity integrated. And some people say there were no resources to uh, create these um, these uh, churches at that time, but it's also it's also like a matter of like um, different types of uh, histories fighting each other, one destroying the other, or one taking advantage of the ruins of the other, and then which um, which history is coming out or which history is celebrated. Um, it's interesting through these marks that are enclosed in the walls. And um, my interest like in, the, uh, in these walls um, and textiles um, uh, is also something um, Gottfried Simper has um, explored. And uh, for him, the beginning of building walls is the beginning of textiles. And he talks a lot about the weaker work and how like this material, um, uh, either through fences or by making baskets and making uh, bassinets, um, started making the wall. So the patterns that we see in the walls uh, come from these patterns of weaving. Um, this is the database project that uh, I've participated um, very, I, I was very young at the time and like, uh, and quite curious, but didn't know anything about this idea of like nomadism. And so the, these are the items that the refugees brought and as mentioned, some of them from my family. So I see these type of items in my home a lot and the items, so people who've experienced like say uh, being refugees may keep collect, collecting things that are precious, but they, we may be collecting things that are uh, also ordinary. So among like uh, in this collection of like um, items, some of them are, are, are towels, kitchen towels or um, uh, utensils for eating. Um, some things that we wouldn't necessarily um, praise as gold and, um, and other metals. So I am very um, interested about these objects that um, I'm forced to be connected with myself, like moving in the world as many of us, uh, either 
either because we have to either out of choice um but still we uh, are forced to find ways to connect to our histories and linkages and um with this work putting these ideas together i hope to uh uh, integrate these histories and uh, hidden stories and uh, rituals, memories into the physical environment. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. That was wonderful. Um, if you could stop sharing your screen. And then our next presenter is Hinda Mandel presenting Rochester Ladies Anti-Slavery Sewing Society, Race and Gender in Mid-19th Century Handicrafts as a Tool for the Abolitionist Cause. Hi everyone, good afternoon. I'm, uh, my name is Hinda Mandel, thank you for the introduction. Uh, lovely to be with you all um, virtually today. And I'm coming at you uh, from Rochester, New York. I do not have a visual presentation. Um, so my contact information is up there and I'm going to stop uh, sharing um, my screen at this point. So you will be looking at my face if you are, uh, if you're looking at your device. So the talk I'm about to give is part of a, a broader project that puts forth three handwork metaphors to analyze points of friction around race that emerge in the annual reports of the Rochester Ladies Anti-Slavery Sewing Society from uh, the mid 1800s. Their first report was published in 1852, uh, which is a year after the group was founded. And their 17th and last report was published in 1868, three years after the end of the Civil War um, in what is now the United States. Based in Rochester, New York, about a six hour drive in today's geography from New York City, the Rochester ladies were the prime benefactors of the great abolitionist and father of the civil rights movement, Frederick Douglass, and his newspaper, The North Star. Uh, Frederick Douglass actually spent his formative years from 1849 to 1872 in Rochester. So I'm gonna uh, share very briefly the three textile metaphors that undergird this broader uh, research project before focusing on um, the last one for this talk. Uh, so the, the first um, textile metaphor is the construction of weaving as representative of social structures. Uh, the second metaphor is the search for seams as sites of tension and transition. And uh, the third metaphor, which will be the focus of this talk, is the symbolism of the needle as a mending device. Uh, but, but before getting into that uh, metaphor, I want to talk about uh, the emergence of the Rochester Ladies Anti-Slavery uh, so Sewing Society to offer a historical background on this social reformist group. In 1849, when the British abolitionist Julia Griffiths arrived from England to Rochester, New York, no one could have known that her presence through her insertion into the Frederick Douglass family household and as founder of the Rochester Ladies Anti-Slavery Sewing Society would create such a social stir. Griffiths and her sister Eliza Griffiths met Frederick Douglass during his tour of England in the mid 1840s. And the sisters moved stateside in 1849 with the intention of harvesting their wealthy connections in England in financial support of Douglass's work. Uh, particularly in the nascent years of his North Star newspaper, which was founded in 1847. But as Julia Griffiths made her way through the connected web of Rochester's activist uh, networks, she found herself at odds with a prominent member of, uh, at the center of that activist circle, which is Amy Kirby Post, a leader in the region's anti-slavery movement. Described by one historian as possessing an authoritative style, Julia Griffiths was actually an inveterate fundraiser, but Amy Post bristled at Julia Griffiths' refusal to engage in women's rights reforms and saw her approach to politics as too partisan. 
In Julia Griffiths, however, Frederick Douglass found an unabashed uh, supporter, fundraiser, confidant, and business partner. His requests for financial support uh, of Julia Griffiths were welcomed, in contrast to the more conservative reactions of Amy Post, who requested that he open up his North Star newspaper financial books to inspection in exchange for uh, remuneration, at which he bristled. What separated Amy Post and Julia Griffiths the most and which connects directly to Griffith's founding of the Rochester Ladies Anti-Slavery Sewing Society is their contrary approaches to race relations, according to Amy Post's biographer, Nancy Hewitt. Quote, while Griffiths befriended Douglas and lived in his household for an extended period, she was not an advocate of interracial organizing. When she founded the single sex Rochester Ladies Anti-Slavery Society, she invited white women, most from well-to-do families, to join. Post, on the other hand, was active in the Western New York Anti-Slavery Society, an interracial and mixed sex organization that attracted people from diverse economic backgrounds, end quote. The Douglas Griffiths Alliance cemented Julia Griffiths standing as an abolitionist insider, albeit a highly divisive one especially so when Douglas declared her social reform group as the sole bearers of women's abolitionist work in Rochester, leaving Amy Post and her Western New York anti-slavery society peers in shock. Quote again from Nancy Hewitt, Post uh, biographer, quote, uh, Douglas both erased their efforts of recent years and anointed the newly formed Rochester Ladies Anti-Slavery Society as Rochester's only female anti-slavery organization, end quote. Even though the women of the Western New York Anti-Slavery Society had worked tire tirelessly in support of the North Star. It's not only the elegantly written reports that reflected the audience whom the Rochester ladies hoped to attract, but it was also the international handcraft for sale at the annual holiday bazaars which the group organized. While the women members of the Western New York Anti-Slavery Society organized anti-slavery affairs in the 1840s, they focused on useful goods for sale, such as local eggs and produce, foodstuffs, hardly the goods that would elicit excitable purchases. But from the get-go, the saleable objects at the Rochester Ladies Holiday Bazaars, beginning in 1851, offered rare finds quite literally, as they were shipped from England, Ireland, Scotland, and Mexico. The annual reports each year took great care to thank their anti-slavery co-workers overseas, explaining the lovely goods that fetched eager buyers. In fact, the reports described the British tables as offering, quote, an elegant and attractive appearance, end quote. While the American tables, were amply provided, excuse me, while, quote, the American tables were amply provided with useful and ornamental articles, the latter of which never received descriptive space in the annual reports. In contrast, quote, the costly Honiton lace and the elegant uh, pupetterie from Bridgewater were greatly admired. The baby's pinafores from Evesham and the delicately made tatting soon found purchasers. Many dozen yards of the tatting could have been sold. The handsome slippers and purses from Birkenhead proved very acceptable, end quote. This is from the third annual report in 1851. Clearly, these foreign-made items of handcraft are described in appealing and valuable terms, further lending a refined patina to not only the handcraft, but the work of the Rochester ladies themselves. It is unclear why the group's size never blossomed commensurate with their good work of aiding escaped enslaved people. For instance, according to its 1855 and 1856 annual reports, the group financially assisted 136 escaped enslaved people who made their way through Rochester, New York en route to Canada. And according to the seventh annual report of 1858, the society assisted, quote, 
about 150 of those weary and travel-worn fugitives who have come to us for aid during the past year. The vestiges of the Amy Post Julia Griffiths rift may have contained the size, as may have the evangelical and non-integrated nature of the group. So too must Griffiths' reputation be taken into consideration. Although she was only one member of the Rochester Ladies, she was also its founder. In abolitionist circles, there was significant animosity directed at Griffiths, who lived with the Douglas family in Rochester from 1849 to 1852. Criticism ranged from superficial, commenting on her, quote, elaborate dress and abundant jewelry, end quote, to defamatory, labeling her, quote, a Jezebel in the national anti-slavery standard, a loaded term connoting religious and sexual infidelity that was not lost on readers. These sentiments were all very public and were part of a broader campaign from an imposing political abolitionist camp in an effort to discredit Frederick Douglass due to his associations with Julia Griffiths. Indeed, the nature of the Griffiths-Douglass relationship was complicated because not only did she offer political support, business support, and emotional support, but the Griffiths sisters also offered financial support that helped the entire Douglass family. For instance, in 1849, the financial footing of the North Star newspaper was so bleak that Eliza Griffiths loaned Frederick Douglass $1,000 to bring it into a more secure future. I'm now gonna shift to talking about uh, the needle as a forward-facing site of repair. External to the world of handcraft and its makers, needles are sites of danger, fear, pain. But within the handcraft ecosphere, they are tools of repair and of bringing parts together. The violence they enact on fabric is temporary. Its impact typically invisible and subsumed within a more pleasing embroidery or a functional seam. Quote, the needle is used to repair the damage. It's a claim to forgiveness. It is never aggressive. It's not a pin, writes the artist Louise Bourgeois. And the artist Mark Newport argues in his statement that the contact between needle and material is extremely human. Quote, each pierces the substrate it is repairing, performing a modest violence upon what is to be mended and reminding each of us of our sensitivity, vulnerability, and mortality, end quote. This affords needles a symbolic role as future and forward-facing tools, as, unif as unifying tools that can point us in a future orientation. In this way, the needle becomes an incisive metaphorical apparatus to see how the Rochester ladies position its work upon the conclusion of the Civil War. The 10th Rochester Ladies Report offers an apt place to center analysis of the needle within the context of their work. Since its publication that year chronicled their work from 1861 to 1862, marked by the start of the Civil War. When a national rupture can no longer be contained, when political seams are no longer merely visible but torn open, in which way does the social reformist group pivot in the nature of its work? First, the group continues with, quote, the aid of fugitives. A large number have been helped on their way during the year and some clothing furnished to those in need, according to the 1861 report. No holiday bazaar was held that year because, quote, the war is such a drain on the resources of the people. However, for the first time, we see the group expressing cautious hope for the future of its work. Quote, from 1861, they write, we have but to hope that the day when our work will be the elevation of a free people instead of the liberation of a nation enslaved is rapidly approaching. Future facing, steely and prescient, the report declares, quote, the slave system may struggle for a while. It may and will find advocates in the North. Compromise may again rear its head for its defense, but it must die. In the group's 14th annual report of 1865, three years before the group's work comes to an end, they adopt a name change to reflect uh, the transforming political environment. They become the Rochester Ladies Freedmen's Aid Society. Despite the prospects of a needle, of a needle 
mending and transforming a social fabric. It cannot erase the past, and even the finest stitchers cannot completely hide their seams. So too is the case with the Rochester ladies as they pivot forward in a country that ultimately abolished slavery, but certainly not its murderous legacy and its continued assault on the social fabric. In the 16th report of 1867, one year before the group closes, they write, quote, to us who feel so much interest in the subject, it seems quite unaccountable that in any Christian community, there should fail to be a cordial interest and ready help in the work. But slavery, though as we trust practically dead, still exhales a poison over our land, making our hearts, which are warm in sympathy towards the white race, cold and indifferent to the welfare of the black. No doubt sensing the end of the group's work, this penultimate report of 1867 straddles a clear-eyed reflection of the group's origins. Now they collect garments for freed people in the South. And yet it closes with a forward-looking direction led by the reparative needle. Quote from 1867, they write, and when the day soon come, when the people now so needing help and instruction may become under a better state of things, self-supporting, self-respecting, and able to maintain at the ballot box their equal rights as citizens of the Republic. It is hard in this fraught political moment, right at this very instant, as people across the US are now voting, not to become emotional at the expressed hope of this reformist group for the people whom they devoted their activist lives, especially having the historical knowledge of the civil rights battle and the pall of white supremacy that continues to rage in this country. Thank you so much for that, Hinda, that was great. Next up, we have Julie Hollenbach presenting Whose Personal is Political? Troubling Privileged Affect in White Feminist Craftivism. So good morning or afternoon, um, depending on where you are. Thank you to Carolyn Sharouk and TSA for this incredible and well-organized and wonderful online conference. Thank you to Carolyn Kipp for chairing the session. And my thanks to the other panelists and attendees here today. I'm glad to be gathered with all of you to engage in conversations about research and practice. My name is Julie Hollenbach. I'm grateful to be able to join you all today from my home. I live and work as an uninvited guest on Mi'kmaq, the traditional, ancestral, and unsurrendered territory of the Mi'kmaq Nation. Hmm. So in August 2017, Julia Feliz published an open letter to the craftivism movement in an online magazine called Medium. In it, Feliz challenges the whiteness trenchant in craftivist culture and the prominence of empty allyship within the craftivist actions and organizing. She describes her experiences engaging with craftivism over the year, as well as discussing in general problems with white feminist activism. In her article, Felice states that in the beginning of her engagement with craftivism, she had reservations about its claim to gently change the world, but was ultimately drawn to a form of activism that seemed altruistic. So to back up and provide a bit of context before diving in, craftivism is a portmanteau term coined by American crafter and artist Betsy Greer in 2003. For Greer, quote, craftivism is the practice of engaged creativity, especially regarding political or social causes. By using their creative energy to help make the world a better place, craftivists help bring about positive change via personalized activism, end quote. Crafty activism or craftivism became prominent in the United States and the global North in the wake of 9-11 and the election of President George W. Bush and the subsequent election of many conservative political leaders in Western nations. The first decade of the 2000s were marked by Bush's war on terror, aggressive military campaigns, unprecedented surveillance of citizens, a rise in conservative politics and an emphasis on traditional Christian values not to mention the ongoing post-feminist social rhetoric that was dominant at the time. In this social and political atmosphere of increased fear, tension and anxiety, anonymous forms of craftivism began to crop up in the urban environment, covering tree trunks, trash cans and parking meters in gestures that can be interpreted as reparative given textiles association with comfort, intimacy and the domestic. Over the next decade and continuing today, craftivism became a mainstream popular culture and social justice phenomenon 
where craft materials and craft production methods began to be utilized by activists engaging for various causes in service of various politics. Whether craftivism is employed by one person or a collective, by seasoned activists or women who had never protested before, anonymously or notoriously, craftivism as a method of activism appealed to women because it allowed them to express their political dissent in a way that felt personal through a medium and method that affirmed and expressed their identity and values. For many, craftivism is an attractive form of activism because it empowers the craftivist to navigate her identity, her politics, and her values through the material processes as a form of lifestyle activism. Laura Portwood Stacer writes, quote, when individuals who desire social or political change are compelled to shape their personal behaviors and choices toward the ideals they envision, this is known as lifestyle politics. Lifestyle politics reconfigures the everyday of the individual into an ongoing struggle, struggle against domination, end quote. Lifestyle activism is, an appealing, is appealing given how saturated Western culture is with technology and media, the prevalence of consumerism, and the increasing emphasis within neoliberalism on the individual. So even a cursory appraisal of the optics of craftivism suggests that the movement's primary participants are white, middle-class, cis, straight women. Over the last decade, I've been paying attention to craftivism and I've been working through a few questions. Why are middle-class women so drawn to expressing their dissent publicly through handicrafts and tech textiles? And where are the people of color in craftivism? Why aren't there more BIPOC craftivists? Here, I clearly want to define the parameters of my research. I consider the activist activity and production of people who self-identify as craftivists and consider projects and initiatives and groups that apply the term craftivism to themselves. I do not apply the term to anyone or any community or any objects that are not self-defined as craftivist. A fascinating topic for another paper is the retrospective claiming of historic examples of protest and resistance mediated, mediated through craft and textiles as craftivism by contemporary craftivists claiming and constructing a lineage of material activism. Accordingly, this paper presents a critical race analysis of craftivism that interrogates the associations between femininity, middle-class social position, and whiteness with handicrafts, especially needlework, and how these associations strongly impact craftivism's mobilization as a nonviolent form of protest. Furthermore, this paper interrogates craftivism as a form of lifestyle activism that is deeply entrenched in consumerism, asking whether radical change can be mediated through engagement with capitalist markets. In this presentation, I'll address how amateur crafting practices are tied fundamentally to the maker sense of self and how that self is connected to local, local and global social formations and circumstances. So before going forward with an assessment of contemporary craftivist culture and practice, I wanna provide a brief historical note on Western women's handicrafting practices. <clears throat> the groundbreaking work of feminist socialist art historians such as Rosika Parker, Griselda Pollock, Penny Sparks and Anthea Callan on women's and girls' material cultures has shown how in the 19th century, handicrafting, especially needlework, became axiomatic with middle-class femininity in Great Britain. In the subversive stitch published first in 1984, Rosika Parker posited that needlework was the chief practice through which the inculcation of values and ideologies around gender and class occurred. Following the work of Adele Perry and Myra Rutherdale, my doctoral research expanded this treatise to suggest that though through processes of domestication that were central to colonialism in North America, needleworking became a racializing process that marked difference and imposed social hierarchies. So on the slide right now, uh, this advertisement for ivory soap from the Ladies Home Journal is a helpful illustration that demonstrates the conflation of femininity, class and whiteness as identity categories in the 19th century. From the 19th century onward, middle-class women have identified with crafts connotations of traditional femininity, or identified with crafts subordinated and devalued place within the cultural hierarchies of a patriarchal society, a cultural hierarchy which legit legitimated professionalized men's artistic and craft output and belittled or ignored women's creative work. 
Amateur crafts have been used and continue to be used for its literal association with the history of feminine gentility, thrift, industriousness, and disciplined skill, or metaphorically as a symbol of the historical trivialization of girls and women's domestic work and culture, allowing for the ironic and subversive use of domestic crafts to reject traditional restrictive values and meanings. Today, white women encounter the legacy of these gendered, classed, and raced associations with needlework and handicrafts and continue to operate within the historical framework of these inherited meanings. Whether it is the celebration of a nostalgic femininity that is the legacy of Victorian handicrafts or the romanticized masculinity of handcrafters as galvanized by the arts and crafts movement or the disavowal of these traditional gender identities and gender roles by feminist artists who use craft subversively beginning in the 1960s. I argue that textiles and crafts have served both conservative feminine values and radical feminist meanings sometimes employing either trope in opposition to the other, and sometimes employing both synchronously. White middle-class women have long vocalized their discontent and dissent, as well as their pleasure and desire through handicraft and needlework, making it a powerful and polyvocal form of expression that is imbued with numerous symbolic significances. The politics of identity are embedded in craft and craft making. Therefore, for many crafters, craft can feel like a political act. This is UK-based craftivist, Sarah Corbet. Corbet founded the Craftivist Collective in 2009, an international group of craftivists that participate in easy to do crafty activist projects shared on the Craftivist Collective website as such as craft kits um, and other sort of material kits that can be purchased. One such project here pictured is the cross-stitched mini banners that were strung up throughout London during fashion week providing statistical information about the exploitative labor conditions prevalent throughout the fashion and textiles industry. In How to Be a Craftivist, The Art of Gentle Protest, Corbet describes her activist journey, writing that she is not an anarchist and that she doesn't condone sabotage, violence, or demonization. She goes on to write that craftivism is focused on non-intrusive actions aiming to educate and raise consciousness instead of bullying and preaching. According to Corbet, her brand of craftivism produces, quote, cute, kitsch, and non-threatening objects that hopefully leave seeds in people's minds rather than telling them what to do, end quote. On the Adopt a Craftivist page that is a Patreon-style crowdfunding campaign to support Corbet's work, she writes, quote, shouting, heckling, and hating are not the only forms of political engagement. Leonard Cohen said, there is a crack in everything, that's how the light gets in, our gentle protest, our gentle protest approach to craftivism is part of that light and it is getting in, end quote. Along these lines, Corbet also notes in How to Be a Craftivist that, quote, approaching injustice with aggressive anger is unhelpful to protest. A more effective way to protest is through compassion and empathy for all involved, the victim, perpetrators, and everyone in the process, recognizing that human beings are fragile and should be handled with care, end quote. This approach situates craftivists as arbitrary outsiders whose own personal well being is not at risk and who will not be directly affected by the outcome of the craftivist action. Indeed, many craftivists profit from their crafty activism by selling craftivist pieces on their websites or on Etsy.com. However, the draw to craftivism for many middle class women is not only that crafting is rewarding and an, and an enjoyable pastime but that there's also the added bonus of the belief that the pastime could be political as well as have practical applications. And of course, the empowerment that comes from the public validation of personal gestures as important and relevant. In an article published in 2012, Sarah Corbet with Sarah Housley wrote that craftivism reaches, quote, a different audience than the average activist group, end quote thereby spreading their message to populations who might be less susceptible to what they deem aggressive activists. For Corbet and Housley, high visibility projects that appeal to media coverage is an important strategy in their craftivist approach as it could, quote, expose a powerful and largely peaceful sector of society, the affluent middle class, to our aims and manifesto, end quote. Here I note that this peaceful middle class is first a generalized fantasy, and second, imagined largely as a homogenous group, <clears throat> presumably white, affluent, and heteronormative, 
which means that this generalized class can be perceived as peaceful because it occupies an uncontested position in society and shores up and is served by the status quo. Furthermore, craftivism is palatable and not threatening to powerful individuals and the institutions of power alike, it does not pose a challenge to systemic oppression, attack structural inequality, or threaten to disrupt the status quo. Often, especially in the most popular forms of craftivism, emphasis is placed on the aesthetics of the crafted token and the social capital that comes from a public activist gesture, what is commonly or frequently termed as virtue signaling. A prime example is the infamous pussy hat that became a popular symbol of solidarity at the Women's March in January 2017. Seldom is there a deeper engagement with the issue that many craftivist initiatives activate around. As Julia Feliz noted in her open letter, quote, the craftivist movement is one that takes pride in some of the most nonsensical white feminist privileged stances that actually works to silence people of color like me, instead of actually doing the work to create real change, end quote. Often craftivists take up issues and causes outside their own community that do not affect them directly. The illusion that this form of leisure can be activated and politicized as a form of activism, however, allows middle-class white craftivists to channel their discontent and anxiety around injustices they see taking place somewhere else without having to address how changing the circumstances of injustice would mean radically destabilizing their own lives through, through disrupting structures and that materially and socially privilege them. Andrei Grubacic argues that those involved in humanitarian activism from positions of relative privilege cannot be radical instigators of change. Instead, humanitarian activists often look for someone else located somewhere else to invest all of the revolutionary aspirations that they desire but cannot realize in the complexity of their own lives. Therefore, they seek to assist, organize, and facilitate the struggle from the outside. A.K. Thompson, an activist as well as a scholar, has written on the figure of the white, of the young white radical active in the alter globalization movement, offering an insightful critique which though shows that for many disillusioned white people, the local and the community have become fetishized stand-ins for the site of legitimate struggle outside of middle-class experience. On this point, Thompson draws on Charles Hamilton and Stokely Carmichael, who reflect in their book, Black Power, on the involvement of white activists in the civil rights movement. Hamilton and Stokely write, quote, they, white radicals, have wanted to be where the action is, and the action has been in those places. They have sought refuge among blacks from a sterile, meaningless, irrelevant life in middle-class America, end quote. Along these lines, Max Haven and Alex Nazanabish suggest that, quote, through ideological thinking, abstract categories are substituted for complex social realities, resulting in the fetishization and valorization of the imagined oppressed other, which stands in for the subject and the social location of authentic social justice struggle, end quote. So when Sarah Corbet and members of the Craftivist Collective cross-stitch mini banners as interventions in London's Fashion Week frenzy, they homogenize the plight of textile workers in non-Western countries. Bangladesh, India, China all become the same location, the othered somewhere else. In so doing, they romanticize the unfathomable exploitation that is the daily norm for sweated workers. The Craftivist Collective and other Craftivist initiatives like it work to obscure the actual forms of oppression that take place and dangerously placate people's complacency by suggesting that soft forms of activism are enough. As an example, here is the craftivist manifesto. Um, in the third point, Corbet suggests that the act of stitching the banners allows for craftivists to embody solidarity with exploited workers by expressing their activism through needlework. So just to quote it here, the third point, uh, preserve the dignity of others by showing solidarity with them in your craft, understand their struggles, and you'll understand the solutions. Activism is not charity." End quote. Expanding my analysis of the emphasis on gentle and nonviolent activism, I want to unpack the implications of public expressions of affect, of feeling, in craftivism and provide a critical analysis of which bodies have access to public space and which subjects feel that the public realm is a viable site for their action and aff affective expressions of dissent. Like Corbet and Greer, many craftivists employ the second wave feminist rhetoric of the personal is political 
as a way of empowering and legitimating their personal lives and intimate gestures with radical potential. In second wave feminist organizing, white women foreground their experiences and their emotions as being a powerful deconstructive methodological tool that countered the established patriarchal modes of thinking and theorizing that valued and dismissed feminine, um, femininity and its associations, the emotional, the sensual, and the subjective. Within craftivist rhetoric that draws on notions of the feminine and the feminist, the emphasis on emotion is further tied to a third way feminist politic of pluralism and identity as mediated through consumerism and lifestyle and a neoliberal feminist emphasis on individualism. The assumption that the empowerment and emancipation of the individual will bring about mere changes in society. The identification with the hegemonic bourgeois femininity, femininity accompanied by feminist politic sensibility empowers the white woman craftivist to believe that her self-expression in a public arena is valuable and important. It is, as I have previously suggested, tied to the impulse of what Barbara Heron calls white moral responsibility. The impulse to intervene in injustices and the belief that the white person's intervention will be seen and heeded, and in this case, all the more so, when it is couched in the Trojan horse of crochet and good feelings. Furthermore, many craftivists often disclose that they have turned to craftivism as a remedy for depression, alienation, and activist burnout. Perhaps because along with being imbued with feminine affectivity, craft has over the last century been utilized as a recuperative technology in the West for those recovering from trauma. However, I wonder about placing depression and burnout often cast as a white woman's malady into the public realm as a political event and whether it can have the negative effect of fetishizing and sensationalizing white women's despondency. Whose grief and woe and effect of suffering does the public hold and make space for? If, as Normal Poir suggests, quote, bodies do not simply move through space but constitute and are constituted by them, end quote, then I would argue we read we can read the making of space that supports and legitimates white affect as suggestive, especially in contrast to the demonization of public examples of black women's anger and black outrage in general. Spaces oriented around whiteness enable and permit white bodies while racialized bodies prickle with what Sarah Ahmed terms third person consciousness, belonging to the body out of space experienced as the restriction and negation of the racialized body. Sociologist Sarita Srivastava offers an important analysis of the genealogy of emotion and the priority placed on feelings at the heart of much feminist activism, tracing the evolution of the personal is political to its earlier root in 19th century Marxist socialism that emphasized the importance of the everyday experiences of the working class individual. In second wave feminist organizing, as I mentioned, white women foregrounded their experiences and their emotions as powerful deconstructive tools. Feelings and emotions remain empowering at the core of feminist activism and scholarship. However, Srivastava proposes that not everyone's feelings are equally validated within feminist organizing and that the expression of feelings by white women can often have the detrimental effect of silencing certain voices or potentially inciting violence and harm that can and has led to the death of black people and people of color. This point feels particularly pertinent to considerations of how affect is invoked and how race is constituted in craftivism in our current moment. So just closing up here, where white women have been assured since the 1960s that the personal is political and that their feelings are valuable, black women and women of color in North America have always occupied the public sphere through labor and have had their voices, their feelings and their bodies stridently and violently policed or erased in the public realm. In her essay, Age, Race, Class and Sex, Women Redefining Difference from 1990, Black lesbian and feminist Audre Lorde describes the daily lived experience of the violence of systemic racism. She writes, Black people, quote, know the fabric of our lives is stitched with violence and with hatred, and there is not rest. We do not deal with it only on the picket lines or in dark midnight alleys or in the places where we dare to verbalize our resistance. For us, increasingly, violence weaves through the daily tissues of our living in the supermarket, in the classroom, in the elevator, in the clinic, and the schoolyard from the plumber, the baker, the saleswoman, the bus driver, the bank teller, the waitress who does not serve us, end quote. Craftism seems to be limited not only to the people who have the resources, time and money to craft, but the luxury to express their dissent in a gentle, nonviolent manner in the public space. For many people, racialized and poor people especially, and often through intersections of oppression, queers and transgender people, as Lord suggested in the quote I just read, activism and protest are violent because of the press on life by the reality of systemic oppression in brutally and insidiously violent um, circumstances. 
So to close, um, the call for craftivism has become to become more intersectional and reflexive has been struck. Um, that this, you know, Julia Feliz's article was three years ago, um, and it's still to be seen how that will be taken up. Um, for her own part, Sarah Corbet posted this in her blog in this past June, in which she responded and said that she's reflecting on her role within white supremacy, acknowledging her white fragility and how the craftivist collective could be better allies in the work of dismantling white supremacy. Though further down in the post, she goes on to share various kits that can be purchased in the craftivist collective website store, such as this ethically made solidarity bunting DIY kit. Uh, when I first read the words around the image, I thought it said, teach solidarity to young ones using capitalism because black lives matter. So in closing, it remains to be seen whether the craftivist movement will shift and self-assess in response to critical feedback and whether craftivism will trouble its deeply entrenched attachments to the market and capitalist values. Thank you. Up next, we have Catherine Dormer presenting the arts of urgency, textile practices and truth telling. I'm gonna say good evening because I'm actually joining you from London. And um, thank you, Julie, for your um, paper, which sets me up perfectly. Um, or imperfectly, um, and I'm a little bit nervous now, but um, we, will, um, we can have that conversation afterwards. Um, so the arts of urgency, textile practices and truth telling. I wrote this abstract and started thinking about the arts of urgency some time before the global pandemic emerged, in part as a response to speak at an event called the urgency of the arts at my university. It seems even more apposite today when we're all living under constrained conditions the economies of the world are struggling and the arts are under their greatest threat for many generations. I still want to talk not about the urgency of the arts, but the arts of urgency. I want to focus upon tactics for making public realities and truths. I want to ask how, art, how can art and artists, specifically those working with textiles, express horror, suffering, collective and individual trauma with intelligence, rigor, truthfulness, integrity and ethics. And how can we do this collectively in the current and emerging contexts? Today, in this short time frame, I propose to approach these ideas through two artists who deploy textile practices as acts of resistance. The first is the Chinese artist Lin Tian Miao, and the second, um, and this is where I get nervous, um, is the uh, um, US collective of Jaina Zweiman, Christine, Krista Su, and Kat Doyle. What these share in common are an aesthetics and politics of spatiality and collaborative action. And through this, they produce discourse around female agency and disempowerment, negation and erasure. These are acts of truth telling through textile actions, which purposefully use feminine intimacy as a feminist strategy for producing spacious rubric. These are necessarily flawed, as Julie has just so beautifully articulated, and yet in the texture of these forms, there is still scope for spatial thinking and they can reveal truths. Alexandra Kokoli, in her essay, Do Textiles Think, considers feminist textile strategies as ambiguous practices and notes that some matter is more slippery or perhaps more knotted than others. In this, she draws together not only the very properties which render textile practices feminine and soft, but also through the textural surfaces created by their slipperiness and knottiness, she reveals their capacity to be agents of material intimacy. Textiles are in everything and are witnesses to everything. In their ambigu ambiguity, they see and can speak truth. If textile practices and their outcomes are both ambivalent and ambiguous, then they occupy textural ground between artistic practices and the interstices of culture. Textile practices as mediating materiality of intimacy function everywhere and nowhere. They are in a perpetual place of flux between banality and refusal, slipping and sliding into these intimate interstices, knotting expansive and textureful structures as they do so. To speak of textile practices as mediating materiality of intimacy is to speak of their capacity to address the vulnerable female self. Judith Butler suggests that the dominant conceptions of vulnerability pre-suggest the protection of the vulnerable as the key site of agency, and this positions vulnerability within a framework of victim and passivity, potentially rendering the vulnerable as inactive. 
If, however, as Judith Butler proposes, vulnerability and resistance are reset, they become strategies for reckoning, creating a space of agency and belonging predicated not upon the politics of power and spatiality and occupation, but upon ambivalence, intimacy and an ecology of truth. To speak of an ecology of truth specifically in terms of textile practices is to harness its ambivalence in textural forms through Butler's redressing of the relationship between vulnerability and resistance. The portrayal of the recipients of humanitarian actions, the vulnerable, sets the subjects as the suffering other, mute, helpless, violated and deprived, and thus demanding effective responses. We are all implicated in this ecology. In taking those bodies into the politics of the street as agential, resisting bodies, an ecology of truth an ecology of truth comes into action and vulnerability becomes entangled with agency. In Lin Tian Mao's objects, intricately bound with silk and cotton threads and fabrics, they form recognisable and yet obscured assemblages of elements. This blurring of hard and soft edges is the core of Tian Miao's visual language, one that speaks to her childhood memories of helping her mother sew and make clothes for the family. Real objects become symbols of themselves, vulnerable to shifting meaning, and yet solidified in space and time. Women's domestic work, often, often a concealed duty, is brought to the foreground here, resisting its silencing through an act of silencing. Behind the bound objects, a large screen plays a video of close-up scissors cutting hanging threads. Again, women's work, the endless, and repetitive acts and actions are brought to the fore, no longer silenced and rendered without agency. They take up the whole space, emboldened and loud. Tian Miao's practice speaks of the domestic and industrial production of textile and clothing, most often undertaken by impoverished women in impoverished parts of the world and in unsafe conditions. Clothing that the world demands ever more for ever less. Writing of Qian Mao's practice, curator Peggy Wang notes that she uncouples descriptions of herself as a Chinese woman artist, resisting such essentializing titles, and in so doing offers an assertion of Butler's unpacking of vulnerability resistance relationships. Taking thread as a formal material and spatial element in her practice, Qian Mao sets up a dialogue between that which is described and that which actively presents or represents itself. Her works challenge the notion of an artwork as a final or finished form, setting them more as sites for exploration and ongoing expression. The works give a materialization of her own voice as an artist. They speak as a tactics of interrogation and resistance, including practices of classification. In one of her early works, The Proliferation of Thread Winding, 20,000 needles protrude from a rice paper covered bed each attached to an individual strand of white thread. Her work speaks into the repetitive, tedious domestic work, whilst also into a nostalgic lament and the comfort of the repetitive tasks of her childhood. Here, thread and its winding take on Coley's ambivalence, allowing space to be both drawn in and cut free, an act of vacillation, vulnerability and resistance held together in the bound forms. Curator Liao Wen, in a catalogue essay, writes, the proliferation of writing, winding, utilises simple and complex, unified and repetitive, repetitive knotting structures, pointing the viewer back to the threads. We can see this again in a more recent work, um, Hi, I'm sorry, that's not the right picture. Hi, a video, proje pro video project, pro projection of the artist's face slowly moving from neutral to smiling. Individual knots of thread pierce the scrim screen and reach back to a more wall-mounted piece of fabric that acts as a baffle. Here textile and thread become not only sil silently witnessing substrates but the very material that make image and sound possible. The threads register the capacity to make the invisible visible. What this work also allows the viewer to navigate is a route into the work that addresses the marginalization of women and textile practices through a, practice, through a practice of ambivalence that embraces vulnerability, not to render passive, but as a tactic of agential expression. <laughs>
Qian Mao's threads talk of truth and establish themselves as the agents for truth, whilst allowing themselves to remain tentative, provisional and ambivalent. This is the precarious ecology of truth telling. In another response to political, to the political, this time the openly and aggressively misogynistic discourses reverberating across the Americas and beyond, Janus Spyman, Krista Sue, and Kat Coyle conceived of the pussy hat. It acts as both a visual symbol of protest against Donald Trump's grab and by the pussy remarks through a visual and material reclamation of the word. It is an extraordinary truth that our present moment is one in which women in America and beyond feel compelled to wear pussies on their heads as a visible and unmistakable reminder to all who dare or care to look that it is not acceptable to make women's oppression a policy recommendation. We see echoes of the discussions across the globe. Whilst the pussy hat is often interpreted to be a wearable way in which to grab back control over our bodies, Surveys from the protests of 2017 and afterwards found the symbolism of the hat remains confusing and complicated and deeply flawed. Many argue that it suggests and reasserts an overly close and essentialist association of women with their bodies, and that it is this biology that has been used to silence them and render them vulnerable and thus in need of male protection. It also signals craftivism as a largely middle-class, white, heteronormative set of privileging actions. Katia May moves the debate away from such binary notions of good or bad activism or good or bad feminism that themselves could be seen, could be seen to be constructs aimed at derailing the project and the agency it potentially affords. She proffers the term texture as a lens, allowing textile language of threads, knitting and entanglement to permeate into the debates. Rehabilitating the material and materiality of the pussy hat into this discussion allows us to reflect upon the agency and potency of such textile actions on their own terms. The v &A in London holds a pussy hat and, I'm trying to find it, and labels it thus. Pussy hat worn at the Women's March in Washington on 21st of January 2017. It also states that it is a global symbol of female solidarity and the power of collective action. This symbol is an average sized pink knitted hat with a wide cuff area followed by stocking neck stitch with two pointed ears on each side of its upper end. It also happens to be the very hat that Jane as Zweiman wore to the march. Julia Brian Wilson suggests that to textile politics is to give texture to politics, to refuse easy binaries, to acknowledge complexities. Such texturing returns us to Kakoli's knotty and slippery material. Texture is uneven and nubbly. It invites closer inspection. It gives rise to relief and shadow. It makes visible its own uneven surface. And it is almost inevitably uneven and flawed. The pussy hats form a texture against whose surface communal and individual bodies become shaped by public, intimate, private and political spaces, including those excluded by those very hats. At the same time, those shaped bodies permeate into the spaces that have shaped them. This interplay between body space and the textures formed by it can be epitomized in the pussy hat. The pussy hat is not about pink eared knitted headpiece. It is about anger, discontent and solidarity. It is flawed, it is dangerous. It is about refusing the power structures of vulnerability and giving agency to resistance in collaboration with vulnerability. And it needs to be extended. There are many arguments and criticism that can be fairly leveled at the women's marches and the use of the pussy hat as a supposedly unifying symbol for all women. And yet when these debates and critiques are unraveled, it would seem that the hat is at once too overtly body, bodily, too playful, too aggressive, too cute, too white. May contends that the pussy hat project faced scrutiny on all these levels specifically because it was part of a woman-led action and made use of a stereotypically feminine practice, knitting. In this, it chimes with Tian Mao's winding thread practice. What is interesting about knitting is that in its ubiquity, it enables different relationships with and about it to coexist and within its nubbly textured surface. This ubiquity has often resulted in an inattention as a set of expressive factors, practices, but as an act of resistance, it harnesses vulnerability heroically. 
In the case of the 1980s Women Peace, Women's Peace Camp at Green and Common in the UK, their self-defined image of women knitting and their fibre installations allowed for their presence to be dismissed initially as unimportant and ineffective. Shannon Black suggests that the Pussy Hat Project should be thought of as a textile craft-based initiative that whilst encouraging activism is also accessible and, and multi-scalar. It is this capacity to function at personal, community, national and international levels that gives it its agency for political and cultural change, but it needs extending. In its texture and looped form, the knitted hat enables engagement from multiple platforms and spaces. It com complicates into itself the individual makers, as well as the marchers, different and individual trajectories and experiences of disconsent and drivers for resistance. Through such collective action, participants and viewers become more aware of their, their, their or our own positionality in relation to other bodies and the texture of that spatiality. It asks us to consider what is it, who is also left out, what discourses are left out and excluded. What emerges from the Pussy Hat projection is the notion of textiles functioning both as symbolic and material act and action. It can become a framework for an ecology of truth, but it is not enough. The knitted, knotty looping of knitting together with the bodies that make and wear them become agents for change through the act of becoming vulnerable, but this is not enough. The hat in its ubiquity, softness and playfulness in its girly pinkness enables engagement and textural interplay between diverse groups of people to take action together, but it is not enough. As May writes, it is in this mode of bringing people together to explore and create the texture of a joint struggle for liberation that I located the project's potential for fostering feminist solidarity. Through making, sharing and wearing the hats, the texture of truth-telling emerges that is knotty, holy, entangled, fluffy and messy, but it allows for both ambivalence and complexity to co-reside. This texture allows for further entanglements and unravels binary structures, but is, not but is not sufficient nor expansive enough. I want to close by referencing a series of events held in London in September 2014, Rematerializing Feminism. Its ambition was to create a space in which different feminist voices could gather to share commonalities across their differences. The title was intended as ambiguous and open-ended and provisional, but it was also a reaction to the scant attention paid to the invisible and material female labor and its intersectionality. The events coalesce around a materialistic subject, a subject fra fractured through collective struggle, but also the subject of each singular woman. This is textile's texture. It allows us to name and speak through its ambiguity and embrace empathetic exchange. Through entering into the texture, we can resist binary structures and deploy entanglements as an ambiguous strategy of truth-telling and confusion. In its texture, knottiness and slipperiness, textile is rendered active. It resists and enacts truth, but it needs to become ex expanded practice and stretched to speak into an intersectional audience and to speak with an intersectional voice. I'm Thank done. you so much for that, Catherine. That's wonderful. And finally, we have Alicia Maltz presenting the stories of welcome blanket makers. The faith community at the United Church of Christ in Norfolk, Connecticut created a permeable maker space to serve the larger community. People curious about weaving would come in perhaps to weave a shot or to dedicate um, weekly time to learning the craft. I was soon joined by another weaver and we opened the space to free weaving classes um, every Tuesday afternoon and asked ourselves, what else might we do? It did not take long before the scandal broke. At, well, the first slide was I said that we were creating a maker space. And, um, and had a weaving room as part of that process. So it didn't take long before the scandal broke of our nation's zero tolerance immigration enforcement policy. Children at the border were being separated from their parents. The loom room put out a word of mouth call for security blankets. The parameters were simple. The blankets should be machine washable. They should be small 
and um, since people who are carrying their worldly belongings do not need to be dragging large blankets along. And we requested textures and colors that are comforting to children. Knitters, crocheters, weavers, and quilters got busy. Blankets started appearing in plastic bags on the loom room doorknob. Others arrived with people and stories about how they were made and why. When I submitted this proposal to TSA, I said that I would interview people in the community about the project. At that time, people were happy telling me their stories as they were dropping things off. But once the proposal was accepted, they would not give me permission to tell those stories to you. So um, these are hidden stories, nor could I elicit any stories from the recipients since the immigrant families and especially the children needed to be protected from coyotes. So in lieu of a formal interview, um, I want to re uh, reflect on the following quote, a little behind, okay, um, by the French sociologist Bruno Latour, who said, strength does not come from concentrations, purity, and unity, but from the careful plating of weak ties. With all the blankets, um, showing up, I was drawn to promoting dissemination, heterogeneity, and the careful plating of weak dyes. But um, yet I've come to understand that the project was propelled by the concentration, purity, and unity of the craft people. I invite you to think about what happens if we turn the word but into and. and how can we see strength on both sides? What's the role of dissemination in the interplay between unity and heterogeneity? Um, a running view of craftivism spoken very beautifully in previous talk is performative alliantship. That is that craftivism is done by white feminists who do not recognize their privilege. This claim does not hold up under the scrutiny of the composition of our group. While the town appears to be a homogenous white Republican small New England town, the project revealed significant diversity. People involved in the project age nine to 90 are of all political persuasions. They're first generation immigrants, descendants of the Mayflower, people who live in wealthy summer cottages and people who live in assisted um, housing, gay and straight, anonymous donors and people who come to the loom room like they come to the church's food pantry to get supplies for their family. White and Native American concentration camp survivors, indentured servants, feminists and anti-feminists, climate change deniers and climate activists who identify migration as one consequence of climate. These conversations emerged and were discussed in the loom room. We're not of one identity, yet by responding to the children, we made steps to transcend our differences. Both Democrats and Republicans know that little ones in crisis need their blankies. Our political views were not juxtaposed to one another. Our minds became one as we focused on the children. Our response was, yes, we do care. Eric Olson, the um, minister at the church, defines justice beautifully as the restoration and healing of broken people and systems. And craft for us, for our community, became a pathway to justice. Now I wanna talk a little bit about the phenomenology of it. Um, the loom room is a space for spinning and weaving. It's a very small space. Um, spinning involves the breaking breaking material apart in order to join the parts up together in correspondence. In his talk, Thinking Through Making, the anthropologist Tim Ingold talks about a rope as correspondence of parts. The twist of each strand of the rope is contrary to the torque of the rope as a whole. He reminds us that the syllable arm in Greek means to join. It is the root word of harmony. Sue Williams, who teaches spinning in the loom room, reminds us that the wheel sounds like a heartbeat and the pace of the wheel, no matter how fast, corresponds to the pace of the heart of the spinner. Weaving, 
also um, has this component. It integrates opposites to create whole cloth. Living in times of tremendous fragmentation, it's incumbent on us to ask who and what needs to be brought together. The weaver takes individual separate and unrelated strings and brings them into relationship with each other. Repetitive hand action, especially while meditating, allows for the possibility of transfiguration. Consider the child in the community who allowed his security blankie to be cut up and shared with children he didn't know. Consider the child's grandmother who said, I listen to the news and get so upset. Then I remember, pick up my knitting needles and think of the children. Both grandmother and grandson were engaged in acts of transfiguration, transforming sorrow or anger into something beautiful. In thinking through making Ingold Lichen's craft to medieval alchemy, he talks about the ongoing binding together that happens to the materials and to the maker. This binding together creates coherence. The repetition and rhythms that emerge in the act of weaving, knitting, and spinning opens us to Kairos time or sacred time. In the Greek tradition, Kairos is the brief instant when a weaver may shoot a shuttle through the rising and falling warp threads. That instant allows for a penetrating opening in the weaving of cloth, the weaving of time, the weaving of faith. Hyde encourages us to find a lucky break, a hole in the surrounding cloth. The final stage in any craft making process is giving it away. Charity or giving to strangers has come under tremendous criticism in recent decades. In contrast to the 567 million hits on Google outlining the problems of charity, I uphold Krista Tippett's book, Becoming Wise. Tippett focused on agape, love as embodied compassion, kind of practical compassion that identifies the work that can be done and does it. These expressions of kindness can bring joy to all involved, a sense of communion or belonging together. Hospitality, says Tippett, is a word that shimmers softly. It offers itself as an accessible entry point to love and action. Within a couple of months, we had created 110 blankets and 75 hand knit dolls as well as toiletries and socks for 100 children. We brought them to the church altar and then shipped them out. I've come to believe that the concentrated energy of the crafters was key to finding our lucky break. Without that transfiguration, we would not have been able to find the small opening that allowed us to get the blankets to the children. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about dissemination. Oh, let's see. But, mm -hmm. Sorry, that's a picture of the Statue of Liberty. I can't quite get it. Looked good before. Um, <laughs> when I, um, in a society as fragmented as ours, how do we plate weak ties? When faced with the impermeable wall of ICE detention centers, how do we get blankets directly to children? The ties between our community and the children is attenuated. Two amazing organizations came to our aid. And the first one, uh, first we contacted a lady who said she had a way to get the blankets directly to the children. Um, but we discerned questionable motives. Then we reached out to Welcome Blankets, a group led by Jane, Janice Wyman, who was just mentioned. Welcome Blankets was created as a craftivism response to Trump's call for a border wall. Imagine if the massive distance of the wall was reconceptualized and recontextualized, not to divide, but to include. Instead of a wall, a concrete line to keep people out. What if lines of yarn became 3,500,640 yards of blanket to welcome people in? The 3,200 blanket goal was quickly reached and contributions were displayed in the Smart Museum of Art at the University of Chicago. Then. Accompanied by notes from the makers welcoming newly arrived immigrants, the blankets were distributed to refugees and immigrants in several resettlement communities throughout the US. Given the wonderful craftivism project, we asked Wyman if she knew of anyone who was accepting small blankets for children at the border. 
what a good idea, she said, within 24 hours, this is the advantage of working with activists. She had found a contact in Arizona and established a web page soliciting small blanket donations. ICE has, had decided it was too dangerous to drop families off at the Phoenix bus stops. In response, the city of Phoenix opened a shelter for families who had just been released from ICE. As we realized we could not get the blankets to the facilities at the border, we were still hoping the way would open to get the blankets directly to children within the system. Maybe you could give them to our children, said Dr. Sasha Atkins, uh, my a friend and former student who teaches at Loyola and volunteers at the Heartland Alliance in Chicago. The Heartland Alliance describes itself as one of the world's leading anti-poverty organizations. It has focused on the poor, isolated, and displaced for the last 130 years. It runs the National Immigrant Justice Center and provides a shelter for unaccompanied migrant youth and refugees. Heartland unites the youth with their families, provides educational programs and medical care for them, and runs residential facilities. Given the cold winters in Chicago and the ages of the children, we added handwoven scarves to a bale of blankets and sent them out to Heartland Alliance. We're very grateful for both Welcome Blankets and Heartland Alliance for both of whom with a deep understanding of the meaning of hospitality for providing a bridge between us and the children. In conclusion, Bruno Latour, who inspired my reflections about the interplay of unity, heterogeneity, and dissemination, sees society as the constant creation of networks of people and things. Modern societies, he said, cannot be described without recognizing them as having a fibrous, thread-like, wiry, stringy, ropey, capillary character. Textiles enable us to speak with one voice. Yes, we do care. Just as weak ties between the crafters and the children were mediated by two amazing organizations, weak ties within our community were plated together through the act of making gifts of security blankets. Through this project, our community expanded its understanding of who we are and how these children are part of us. Thank you very much. It's my bibliography and um, my appreciations. Thank you so much for that, Alicia. Um, so I'd like to invite all of the panelists to turn their videos back on during the Q&A portion. Um, and for all the attendees, if you do have questions, please do enter them into the Q&A. Okay, to get into the questions. So for this first one is from John Paul and it's for Julie. Um, thank you for bringing up the important distinction between self-identified craft, craftivists and the colonial claiming of historic craft practices as craftivism. For example, Gandhi's use of Kadi or the Names Project. I was wondering if you could expand on or speak to this issue. Thank you for a wonderful and important talk. Thank you very much, John, for your question. Um, this isn't something that I had a chance to get into in this presentation, um, but something that I have done a bit of writing about uh, elsewhere. I noticed as I've been watching that a lot of craftivists in blogs and other and talks and actions and whatever will, will often cite um, or try to create lineages of craftivism. So we'll then cite, as you mentioned, um, Gan like Gandhi's usage of Kadi, the Names Project, or suffrage banners, or like all these other historical instances where craft or textiles are being politicized, and then say that those things are craftivism. And for a while I was like, oh, is that true? I don't know. And then I was like, I don't think so. Like, I think craftivism for me, the important distinction is that it needs to be something that is like self-identified and self-claimed. Um, because like thinking about, for example, the textiles practices of enslaved like people in the antebellum South during um, like American slavery, those um, like those objects are not craftivism. There's also a question about agency, like who is able to participate and, part and position themselves um, you know, like with their textiles and material practices within a public realm uh, as like activism. So yeah, it's like, it's interesting to me to see who is taking on the label of craftivism and then which people are very specifically not though while still, for example, there's a lot of different material culture um, with the Black Lives Matter movement that we've seen over this year that is like textiles and craft 
that I don't see those people identifying as craftivists or hashtag craftivism. Thank you. That actually leads really well into the second question, um, which is from Kirsten for Julie. Um, do you see a difference in the demographic breakdown between people who primarily call themselves craftivists and textile artists who address topics that are political in nature in their work? Um, thank you very much, Kirsten, for this question. I So like my research is really focusing on craftivists and I think there's a difference between um, the professionalization and the amateurish nature of these practices. So I think, for example, with textile artists, there's, an, a, there's a different alignment to textiles practices within like an artistic realm. Um, and so I think they're two different things. The demographic, studying the demographic of textile artists who have like res critical or resistant practices is super interesting, but isn't actually part of my work. I'd love to hear what other panelists have to say about that analysis, or if there's another attendee. Yeah, do any of you have a response that you'd like to give? Please, Catherine, yeah. I mean, I was, I was really interested in those questions and I'm, I'm really interested, uh, Julie, in what you had to say about you know, people who call themselves craftivists and that retrospective historicizing of it. And what's really interesting is that um, Nancy Gildart in the book, The Object of Labour, quite a few years old now, she talks about textile actions and um, these sort of primary, primal sort of um, actions where people use textiles but it's very separate because the way she sets it up is very, very separate to craftivism. And I think that's really interesting that craftivism is a very considered, decided act. Um, and I think using textiles as an, as an expressive form is something other, um, many, many other things, but it's not just because it's, you know, craft te techniques, it doesn't make it craftivism. I would, I would absolutely wholeheartedly. And I think we have to distinguish between those and not just allow everything or even encourage everything to become this, this under this one umbrella because it's meant, you know, it does, it does what it does, but other things can do other things. Thank you for that. If I can jump in very quickly in response to that, uh, maybe uh, some people, um, I mean, I guess this question is like kind of like the similar discourse we have between a craft and high art um, or works like um, the one I mentioned, like El Anachui, that uh, people say, it, is it um, African or is it um, uh, contemporary um, or is it craft or is it high art? This type of, I think this is very, very, very difficult to, to, to answer um, without, um, without uh, uh, and being fair at the same time to me. And I think, I think it's hard to identify as an, as it is hard to identify as an artist, unless you are privileged. It's really hard, I believe, to self-identify as a cra craftivist, uh, unless you are privileged, because to be able to do that, you need to have time. And if you are, if you belong to um, work, working, I guess, I guess I, I, I mean, my question would be also in response to that, like, is there a middle class or is, is it disappearing uh, even like, but the people who are in, into poverty or into like extreme working class is impossible to self-identify. So yeah, that's my, my answer, my response. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for challenging that a little bit more. Um, I guess we can move on to the next question then. Um, it's for, Catherine specifically. Thank you so much, Catherine. Uh, beautiful presentation. This is from Radhia. I hope I pronounced that correctly. I'm curious to know, as you speak about the ambivalence and ambiguity of textiles, how can one find balance between revealing truths, sorrows, memory, suffering, and so on with textiles being open to interpretation to the uninformed viewer? Are there instances of misreading, misinterpretation, and how can artists avoid that or rather be okay about other people's interpretation of the work? <laughs> Quite a lot in there. Um, I guess the term ambiguity, ambivalence, is as much um, about not, about being um, relaxed about ways that it's read and not necessarily um, 
stating itself. So um, I think it's about rethinking those terms. And it's not about not caring, it's about allowing, uh, allowing ambiguity in there and allowing these practices to be ambiguous. That's okay. We don't have to be sort of overt. And I think in a way, this notion of reading artworks as a sort of ultimate sort of having a particular, they mean this and that's what they mean, is very much comes out of enlightenment thinking um, in terms of truths as singular. And, and I, I guess with textiles, the whole notion is that truths are plural. They're tangly, they're knotty, they're, they're messy, and that's okay. Um, you know, um, I think that's absolutely okay. And I would be really um, uh, sad if everybody looked at my artwork and immediately had the same, un same thinking about it, because I think that would sort of, in a way, essentialize it. Um, and I see that in all the work that everyone's talked about today um, and the other presentations I've been to, that it's the what great thing about textiles is that it doesn't have this singular reading. And I think that's its power. It's part of its problem, but I think it's quite a good problem to have. So I would say um, I'm quite relaxed about that. And if people don't think much of it because it's textiles, well, I can't control that. I can just try and speak a bit more, sometimes a bit more loudly, but just keep on, keep on. Does that sound, it's a bit of a rubbish answer really, but um, I think it's it's about allowing its ambivalence. I, I think that's a perfectly adequate answer. And you know, what is in your circle of control? Only so much ultimately. Um, would any of the other panelists like to address that question in any way before I move on? Okay, great. Um, the next question is for Julie. Is the term craftivism still even still used? Betsy Greer um, dropped it years ago. Are you falling into the same trap you described by giving a problematic term so much agency as a white woman? Thank you very much for your question, Kate. Um, I'm tracking craftivism just by every now and again typing in hashtag craftivism, hashtag craftivist into my Google. I've like bookmarked the hashtag craftivism on my Instagram every day. Many, many posts about people who are making stuff, selling stuff, showing up at protests or marches. And like it's so many different kinds of iterations and examples, um, group pictures, solo pictures, lots of different kind of material culture. If you'd like to explore that answer yourself, I encourage you to do those things. And you'll see, I think that craftivism is still evolving and like with new iterations, but it's still doing stuff and it's active. Thank you for that answer. Yeah, I think I, I personally actually would just like to add on that, um, that within these circles that are very well informed about the issues surrounding textiles and the complexities of textiles, um, things might be evolving, but to a general populace that sometimes it's hard to remember, and I'm speaking for myself here, that um, the, the popular conception of a term or a type of action might not have the same sort of implications or weights or complexities yet. So that's something to just keep in mind. Um, our next question is from Marilyn and it's for Zenobia. Um, Social economic status isn't the only way to view artwork, although I agree with you. Age is a factor as well in consideration. As a retired person, I do have time. Um, yeah, is there anything that you'd like to comment on that, Zenobia? I agree with this point. I just meant that um, um, it's very, I mean, pe people are either like cramped with work um, to survive or um, they have a little bit of time to think. And then, you know, they, there is like this, um, extra time one might have uh, towards, uh, um, I mean, after working so many years. So, but uh, but still, that also is a privilege, no, to have, especially in the United States, um, with um, people having to save for um, for their older times. Thank you for that. Um, so the last question I actually have, and I encourage the attendees to keep sending them, um, is uh, Sarah would be interested in having Julie and Alicia debate their positions on craft activism. 
how does each case inform the analysis of the other? Now, don't feel pressured to do this, but it was a oh, problem. This is my question. Can Sarah, because I would love Sarah to elaborate on which conversation she would love us to have. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's pretty general. Yes. Or it's like either on the mic or in a chat, like if you could please expand on what you would love us to all explore, that would be very helpful to me. Me too. I critiqued Julia's critique of craftivism, it says here over in the chat from Sarah. Oh, okay. So, um, um, actually, I don't think I critiqued Julie's critique. Uh, um, what I was saying was that, um, and I don't think there's anybody in our group who actually calls themselves a craftivist, but um, this is kind of like coming out of a church activity. But um, but there's um, but I was looking at the issue of um, diversity here. Uh, because I'm coming to it um, as an environmental studies person who's interested, uh, professor who's interested in um, climate change and migration issues. And so there are a whole bunch of, um, and um, decolonization, and environmental justice. I taught one of the first environmental justice courses in the country. And, and so it's a very different kind of approach, right? And uh, not the, well, I also, I guess I'm also coming to it as a person who has woven since I was 10 years old. And, um, and as a member of my community, I'm doing something. I don't think I'm directly critiquing Julie's point because I think, um, I think your point is very well taken and very well done. But what I wanna say is that there are um, pathways of, um, well, there are two things. One is that there are um, invisible forms of diversity, which sometimes only show up in the context of women gathering together and um, doing craft. We would never have talked, for example, about um, a member of our community being an indentured servant if she and her daughter had not brought that up. And, um, and so, and, and what that means in terms of the daughter's response to immigration. Um, there also, and the other thing um, is that it's, um, um, it was very difficult to figure out how we would address the gap of the um, between us and New England and the children at the southern border. I mean, that, that felt like such a, I mean, with, with ice standing in the middle, that felt like such, a, um, such an important gap. And we were very grateful to have um, craftivists step in. Well, one group was craftivists, the other group was a social organization, step in and make that bridge. And so I was grateful to them for that. Thank you for that answer. Julie, would you like to say anything before we move on? Um, no, that I really agree. I didn't see Alicia, Alicia, is it Alicia? Alicia, yes. Alicia's point as being in contrast to mine. I think, um, the, like, I'm not a sociologist. I didn't do uh, surveys or a survey. I'm a material culture and visual culture scholar. So I'm looking at the optics. I'm see, looking at what's out there, especially on the net. And so I'm not looking at a, at a, like a specific group. I talk a lot about Sarah Corbet because she's a very public professional craftivist. And, but, um, but I think Alicia is like, studies on a really focused community where a discussion about the specifics of a demographic can be very detailed um, and way more detailed than say optics, like an optics analysis. I don't know if that was actually an answer, but that's my response. It's a conversation and that's the important part, right? Um, this next question is for Dr. Mandel. So for Hinda, do you no, excuse me, sorry, I'm trying to read and talk at the same time. Um, do you know if Douglas's wife, Anna Murray Douglas, participated in fundraising efforts using textiles or crafting? If so, how successful was she compared to Julia Griffith? 
did Julia Griffith and Amy Post consider her a rival for participation of ab abolitionist women in the public space? Did her race limit her participation? That was several questions. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Those are great questions. I love them. So there is not a legacy of, um, of, of written work by Anna Murray Douglas. Um, she is regarded uh, by, history as, by historians as not being able to you know, read fluently. Um, so Anna Murray Douglas's um, role in terms of textile production was really in the home. Um, she mended. She took care of Frederick Douglass's uh, pres a sartorial presentation, shall we say, to make sure that he always had, you know, a really crisp um, appearance in terms of his clothing. Um, she often, for money, uh, took in um, piecework. So she was really busy uh, with her hands um, when Frederick Douglass was on the road, so to speak, in um, today's uh, colloquium, um, colloquial rather, you know, giving, giving his talks, um, you know, they needed money. So she would um, have a private mending practice. She was not a public figure. This is very well documented. Uh, she was incredibly private. And part of that is related to notions of um, what it means to be a middle class or, or an aspiring middle class wife. Uh, part of that was due to the protective nature. Uh, Frederick Douglass had enemies. There were people who were out to uh, smear his reputation. Um, these also include, um, you know, enemies is a strong term, but in the abolitionist camp, you know, there were warring um, abolitionist group. So, so Anna Marie Douglas, she was very private, but I will um, close by, by sharing an anecdote. Um, in 1895, that was the year I believe that Frederick Douglass uh, died, uh, his former next door neighbor was a woman by the name of Jane Marsh Parker. Uh, Young Jane was very young um, when the Douglas family lived next door to them on Alexander Street in, in Rochester. And she wrote a, um, a piece in tribute to Frederick Douglass the year that he died. And in it, she recalled a, a group of um, white women who would gather in the Douglas family home. And I believe those uh, women, perhaps, who knows, um, could have been the Rochester Ladies Anti-Slavery Sewing Society, but she does not indicate that specifically. Anyhow, these women were engaged in cross-stitch, and young Jane mentioned that um, Anna Marie Douglas saw a mistake on one of the um, pieces of stitching that the women were doing, and the way that Jane writes this is, you know, if there was one you know, phrase or word that Anna Marie Douglas felt confident reading, it was the spelling of Frederick Douglass. And when, you know, the young, the, the stitchers, you know, incorrectly left off the second E in, in Frederick. So it's a nice um, textile anecdote. Um, in terms of um, did, her, did her race uh, limit her participation, um, there was, um, you know, excruciating racism directed um, against Anna Marie Douglas, also by um, women, uh, white women who sought claims, uh, romantic or otherwise, to Frederick Douglass. Um, so they would um, publicly criticize her appearance. Um, you know, Frederick Douglass was, um, this has been written about, he was considered, you know, objectively handsome. There were a lot of uh, women who, um, you know, expressed interest in him. And um, some of them in doing so would, um, you know, criticize, um, you know, Anna Marie Douglas's appearance and, you know, intellectual disposition, so to speak. So I would say that, you know, racism was directed towards her, um, but there is not an indication that she herself wanted to be involved in public activist circles. She was focused on the home. Thank you for that. And actually, we, the next question is for you. Um, and uh, uh, Shelley asks, what happened to the other women's group of abolitionists in Rochester? 
So that's a good. Um, I'm I'm not really I'm not really sure. I think you're referring to the um, the the Western New York anti-slavery society, and I don't know um, what came of them following the end of the Civil War. Um, what I do know is that the Rochester Ladies, you know, anti-slavery sewing society. Um, there is so little written about them. We have. Uh, 14 annual reports remaining of the 17 annual reports that existed. That's all that we have. They are housed at uh, the University of Michigan in an archive. Um, we, you know, we don't have any textiles. Um, it's a really small like knowledge base in terms of what we have. You know, in terms of the legacy in general of anti-slavery groups, some of them, you know, pivoted towards uh, women's rights and um, you know the suffrage movement. Um, but the Rochester ladies were specifically focused on abolition and, and did not consider themselves women's rights. They were not interested in women's rights, and they would have bristled at um, the indication that they should be. Thank you for that. Uh, the next question is from Emily, and it's for Alicia. Do you feel that making within your group was a way to navigate moments of helplessness or isolation in a society with weak ties? Yes, I mean, people were seeing what was happening with the children and they were uh, appalled and wanted to do something. And, and there was this uh, real desire to act in some way. Um, um, isolation in a society with weak ties. Um, it's a small New England town. Everyone knows everyone else and they know what's going on with everyone else. And so usually, and, um, and so there's a, um, um, but there was this desire to come together. And I, it was interesting that most of the people who came were elders. Uh, rich and poor, and um, and they and I think there was an element of isolation there, um, and the um, weak ties. Well, I, th I think probably a good portion of the people are related to each other. So, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, in general, um, um, weak ties. Yes, with other parts of the country. I mean, that was definitely there. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, and I think we might have time for just one more question. Um, it's for Julie um, and it's from Kirsten. She says, uh, are you going to address the art, artist versus home craft dichotomy within craftivism in your research? And do you worry about missing movements or actions of what some would consider craftivism that do not tag it on their posts? Thinking about the recent textiles for MVP fundraiser or the movement voter project, which is what MVP stands for, sorry, um, that ran on Instagram? Or are you only focused on those who actively and openly call themselves craftivists? Thank you. This is, thanks. I really appreciate this question, actually. Um, um, so something that I think I would love to tease out a little bit in this space is that there are many um, artists, whether they're in whichever medium, who are also activists. And there are many artists who make their work, who have their practice, but that their activism is separate. And so I think um, I am careful to not project labels or to not project like my politics or my understanding onto individuals or groups or communities. I'm really paying attention to the way that people self-identify, whether they are craftivists or, you know, very vocal textiles artists who are making, who are like, I think my analysis or my interest is lo in looking at um, forms of activism that claim to be viable through engagement with capitalist markets. Um, and then like, what is the nuance there? And then also how there is certain like political traction based on a very specific identity, namely, and like, this is the parameters of my study, the conflation of whiteness, femininity, and a middle-class social position. And so there's a, lot of, there's a lot of different cases and I'm not, and I wanna kind of like stay in my lane and focus on what this research and what my area of study is about. So yes, there are a lot of people doing different things and I think artists 
are while they may still participate in the public realm through social media or through public spaces, are positioning themselves in a different way. Um, and I will, I'm still like I'm still critically engaged in um, an analysis of those practices, but I think it works differently because art work and art practice is a professionalized practice. So it's the public realm in a different way. Thanks. Thank you so much for answering that last question. And thank you all to the panelists for your amazing presentations and for sharing your research with us and to all the attendees for coming and giving us their time and attention. We so appreciate it. We are at time and so I'm going to let everyone go, but thank you again. It's been such a pleasure and I hope you enjoy the rest of the symposium.